The books of Daniel and Revelation are famous for visions of terrible beasts that are persecuting God's people all the way through the return of Christ. In this episode, we're going to look at who these beasts are and what these visions have to say about our understanding of what's soon to come. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the show. Thanks so much for being with me today. If you haven't yet subscribed, make sure you do so and do it on my website, danceoflife.com. Just in case something happens with these platforms, you just never know. That's the best way to stay in touch. But today we're jumping into both the books of Daniel and Revelation. If you've been with me so far, we have been ping-ponging between these two books uh, because they really are teaming up together to give us a whole picture of the end times. If you Recall, there's so many similarities between the books of Daniel and Revelation. Truly, Revelation can't be understood without understanding Daniel. And so we have to look at both, and we have to understand both in context of one another. Now, of course, Revelation was written after the book of Daniel, but it builds off of a lot of things in Daniel, and many of the things that Daniel saw in his visions, even though he didn't really fully understand them, they relate to things that John saw later, because ultimately they're painting a picture of the same timeline of events, which is this antichrist system all the way from Babylon working its way through history into a final iteration, a final system that's going to demand obedience from everybody through the mark of the beast and right before Jesus comes and destroys it. And so today we're looking at the iterations of this system. This is what you have to keep in mind is one system, one antichrist power, one system that has had multiple iterations. And of course, we are living through some of the final iterations today. And so my goal today is to cover these things in history, to give you context, to give you appreciation for where we're at right now. So we're going to look at the visions, the beast visions of Daniel and of Revelation. They both have visions of these beasts. And of course, beasts stand for kingdoms and powers. They're not people. That's an important thing to remember from today. Uh, we'll look at also Daniel's vision of the statue. Now, Daniel, if you aren't familiar, they uh, there's a lot of visions of beasts and kingdoms and powers, but there's also a vision of a statue that he interpreted for King Nebuchadnezzar, who was king of Babylon. And that vision sort of sets the stage for everything else, really, because it's a generalized vision of all of human history and how this Babylonian system basically comes to an end. I mean, it, it goes through various iterations through different empires, but it's really the same system. And that idea started with the vision of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had, and Daniel was basically commissioned to interpret it for him. And, of course, Daniel is the big picture here. We're looking at the big picture of human history, but then John picks up where Daniel leaves off to talk about the end times. Now, of course, we've been living in the end times since the cross. The latter days have been since the crucifixion, because if you recall from previous episodes, that's when Satan was bound spiritually. His power over death was removed. The gospel's going out. Jesus ascended. He's ruling amongst his enemies. We're in the millennial kingdom. This is a time of the gospel basically being trodden underfoot and still, nevertheless, being victorious. That's what we looked at in the two witnesses. The word of God, even though it was in sackcloth and basically being persecuted, very humble situation throughout the Middle Ages and Dark Ages where papacy was ruling everything, it was still victorious. Now, there's a whole process to this. And of course, we're going to look at both of these beast systems. And of course, we're going to start with Daniel first because Daniel sets the stage for everything else. So a couple of important notes. Beasts, again, are systems and kingdoms, political powers, they're not people. This is very important because some modern interpretation of the Bible looks at things like the beasts in Revelation as individuals, right? And, and so they come up with these very wild eschatologies, but it's very clear that beasts are kingdoms and powers. And if we know that from Daniel, then Revelation, again, is very clear. If we don't consider Daniel, then Revelation can be pretty much anything you want to make it. So we got to be very careful. Revelation builds off of Daniel. So all the beasts that you're going to see in Revelation, the first beast from the sea, the second beast from the earth, these are beasts that are systems. They're representative of political powers on the earth. They're not people. 
And again, there's time prophecies associated with this too. If you recall, the 1260-year time period is mentioned throughout Daniel and Revelation. And so this is a very telling thing because if you recall from the 70 weeks prophecy that we did several episodes previously, this is where you start in Daniel's 70 weeks. That's Daniel chapter 9. And that is very clear that the vision that Daniel received, the weeks are symbolic. What is a week? Well, a week is seven days. A day in a prophetic vision is not an actual day, but a year. And so 70 weeks would be 490 days, which actually comes out to 490 years. And we looked at history very specifically. That was a very long episode, but it had to be long because there's so much to consider historically. And when you do, you see how exact Bible prophecy is. Because, of course, it's the Word of God, and God makes things very exact. He's very particular about timing because it proves His sovereign will over everything. And we looked at how that 490-year prophecy, which is the Daniel 70 weeks, how it comes out exactly, absolutely exactly, every year comes out perfectly. Now, the 490-year prophecy, or the 70 weeks, is tied to a greater prophecy that Daniel received of 2,300 prophetic days, which in reality is 2,300 years. And so that can't be taken from that prophecy of 2,300 years. You can't split these two things and look at one of them through the day-to-year principle and another one through literal days. You can't do that. You have to be consistent. And when we do, we see the same pattern over and over again. Daniel mentions prophecies of 1260 years. We see that the papacy ruled Europe for with an iron fist 1260 years exactly from 538 to 1798. And we'll unpack these time periods much more specifically in the next episode and in the following episodes as we really unpack mystery Babylon because that needs some some of its own episodes. But today we're looking at general periods of time and how these things factor into the current system we live in today, because it's all been the same system. It's just gone through multiple iterations. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. We're looking at big picture stuff. Don't forget you have a uh, end times prophetic timeline that it's, it's all visually oriented. So you have the book, both books of Daniel and Revelation. We'll probably look at that today as well, just to kind of see visually how these things lay out. But both Daniel and Revelation, I've laid them out on a physical like time sheet for you, basically like a prophetic timeline that it's visually organized. And so that's a useful tool for you if you are a visual person like I am. And basically it's just available in the comments or the, the description of this episode. So I'm going to put a link for it there. You can share it. You can take a look at it. It's a free resource for you. So hopefully that's useful. But one little note on dispensationalism, you know, we've talked about dispensationalism because it's a very popular way of seeing the end times. And sadly, most of the people who believe in dispensationalism aren't very well educated on the the end times. They think they are, but again, if you study your history, if you understand where dispensationalism comes from, why did it come into modern thinking? It's all to take attention off the true Antichrist power, which is the papacy and the Vatican. That's been the Antichrist power since a long time ago, and it will continue to be. But if they can convince you of this fleshly, worldly way of reading the Bible, where your eyes are on Israel, 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 what's happening in Israel, then you miss what's actually happening in the world that is important to pay attention to. Like the Pope unifying people under one religion, the Abrahamic Accords, the climate change dialectic of problem, reaction, solution people coming together, ecumenism with Protestant America and Catholicism, all these wonders like the Chosen and the Hallow app and Passion of the Christ, all these things are unifying culture into one mentality that is under the beast. But you don't see that or you don't even consider it as a threat if your eyes are on Israel all the time. Do you see how that works? That's the whole point. But dispensationalism has been proven wrong over and over again. If you've been with me through this series, I hope that you see that by now. But dispensationalism does use historical 
understanding when it looks at the beasts of Daniel. So this is, again, just the, the great irony or, or the, you know, it's just a really silly way of looking at Bible prophecy because in some ways they're correct in looking at, his, at these prophecies through a historical lens, right? But then they have other things that they look at through literal lens. So there's not consistency, but basically what I'm trying to say. Like the 70 weeks of Daniel, they see that as a spiritual, as a historical thing, but then they split the the 70th week, the last week, at the very end of time, which makes absolutely no sense because there's no prophecy in the history of the Bible where that is done, where there's a gap of time inserted between, you know, most of the prophecy and then the final bit of it. That just doesn't happen, right? Or or they, they look at historically the 70 weeks as day-to-year principle, meaning 490 years, but then when it comes to periods in Daniel or Revelation of 1260 days, they see that as literal days, so three and a half years. So it's it's just a hodgepodge of understanding that really doesn't make any sense because it's not consistent. But dispensationalism uses historical lens for the beasts of Daniel. So if you've looked into this at all, probably you've come across some dispensational understandings. And the problem with historical the historical lens. Now, if you remember from the very first episode, we talked about there's a problem with each way of interpreting the Bible. And it's not that it necessarily discounts historical understanding or the historical lens. But one issue is that you can appropriate history very easily to pretty much anything that's happened. You can take a look at history and say, oh, well, this is how this was fulfilled. Or it was this empire that this was fulfilled. And so the, the point is this. Dispensationalism's view of these beasts and what kingdoms appeared when and which ones fulfilled what, it seems very convincing. It seems very convincing. It seems like they have their history on point. But in reality, their fundamental premise is flawed because their focus is on Israel. And so they look the the choices for empires that they choose and the sequences of empires and all these things They seem convincing, but you can get so lost in details and empires and things that you forget the whole point, which is that Israel stopped being a chosen people after the crucifixion, really after the stoning of Stephen, because that's when the fulfillment of the 490-year prophecy came to an end. That's when it all was fulfilled, and it was over. And if you recall from some of the previous episodes, we even looked at evidence from the Talmud. Talmud is a major Antichrist book. But in the Talmud, it records that the 40 years after Jesus was crucified, of course, it doesn't say Jesus crucified, but they say the 40 years before the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. 40 years. Every year, their signs for the Day of Atonement were not granted. Normally, they have these supernatural signs or whatever was happening to, to indicate that the sins had been forgiven. Remember, the Jews were always after physical signs. And in the 40 years before the temple was destroyed, which, if you recall, Jesus was crucified in 31 AD. Now, they counted inclusively back then, so it would be 40 years from 31 AD to 70 AD, not 39 years how we would count it. But regardless, the point is this. they Every year after Jesus' crucifixion, which is obvious, they had a, basically they, none of the signs that they were counted on, counted on for the Day of Atonement to go through, went through. None of them. So you tell me, what does that tell you? If you're always going after signs, and for 40 years straight before the temple is finally destroyed, you're getting major signs that your sins are not forgiven. What happened? You crucified your Messiah. That's what happened. The chosen people are no longer the chosen people. Everybody's been grafted in. The church is the new reality. That's been the reality that the new Israel of God, that's been the reality that everything has been leading up to, which is fellowship with Christ. So Israel does not have a separate plan of salvation. So if that is all bunk, it's all just junk, it's been debunked, then you have to question the appropriation of history that dispensationalism does. Because again, you can appropriate history to practically anything. But we're going to use a very common sense approach and see how all these beasts, they all come together with this, the vision of the statue, Daniel's beast vision. There's a lot of diff- different visions that Daniel has. And then, of course, John's vision and revelation of the various beasts that he sees. He sees three beasts, the beast from the sea, the beast from the earth, and then the final 
beast, which is the woman riding the beast, which we haven't gotten to yet, but we are on our way. We're pretty close, I think, but we'll see. So be careful of dispensationalism and with dispensationalist appropriation of history. But my goal is today is to arm you with knowledge and to give you some skills in looking at these various prophecies and visions so that they can seem very plain to you. I mean, it's very simple in some sense. It does it require some digging at first, but really when you look at the big picture, it's actually quite simple. It's the same Babylonian antichrist system that has degenerated over time and basically persecuted God's people. And we're, we're at the end of that timeline right now. If you really understand history, we're at the end of that timeline. So let's start with Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue, because we have a lot of beasts to go through, a lot of material. So that's in Daniel 2, and basically it's a pretty long chapter, but if we look in verse 27 of chapter 2, basically it says, Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. So we know this is not necessarily about his time, but about really kind of the end of time. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. And so a little context really quick. Daniel basically is in the king's court. Nobody can interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. He's really worried about it. He calls Daniel. Daniel says, listen, nobody's going to be able to tell you what the dream is, but God can tell you. And so Daniel proceeds to interpret his dream. And of course, because of that, he's he's elevated to a nice status. But the dream interpretation is as follows. This is in Daniel chapter 2, verse 31. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, meaning a statue, like a big statue, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. So you have this statue that's made of different metals and materials and towards every new layer kind of degrades over time is, is the idea. Verse 34, as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. So quick break. Basically, you have this statue that represents the kingdom over time. And at the end of that time, which we're going to specify all of this in just a second, you have a, a rock. It's not cut by any human hands. So that should be indicative of who that rock is. We know who scripture calls the rock. A rock hits the feet and the entire system basically collapses and the rock becomes a mountain that is forevermore. And mountains in visions are representative of kingdoms. Verse 37. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose, into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell the children of man, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, making you ruler over them all. You are head of gold. You are the head of gold. So Babylon is the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you, take note of that kingdom, shall arise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze and which shall rule over the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. Keep note of the language here, because it's going to become very relevant when we look at the beasts. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all of these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage. That's an interesting statement. But they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. 
So when the rock comes and creates the mountain and the kingdom, that's it. There are no more iterations of this system. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. So, what do we make of this vision? Basically, you have the entirety of human history, starting from Babylon, all the way through the return of Christ, which is the rock that destroys this system once and for all and creates an everlasting kingdom. Now, of course, this is about eternity and not the millennial kingdom because the millennial kingdom began with the ascension of Christ. If you recall from all the previous episodes, the first 10 episodes of this series, we looked at that over and over again and the idea that a future millennial kingdom where Christ is ruling in Jerusalem for a thousand years is a major deception and possibly even something that they're going to try to counterfeit. So you have to be very careful with this teaching. But nonetheless, this, this vision is the big picture vision. And it's in the beginning of Daniel for a reason, because all the other visions that he receives, and then later in John's revelation, it all kind of falls into this idea in this, in this framework of the statue where you have Babylon, the golden head, and it degenerates over time. It degenerates into silver and bronze and iron, and then eventually a system that is barely holding itself together. Now, if we jump to our end times prophetic timeline, now, if you're listening to this, then, you know, go check it out. It's, it's going to be in the description of the episode, wherever you happen to be listening to the episode. I'm going to post the link for this so you can see it. But if you're watching this, you can see that this vision of the statue is pretty much spanning from Daniel's time all the way to the end of time, where, wherever that happens to be. But basically, you have these empires, these, these four empires. You have the gold, you have the platinum, you have the uh, bronze or brass, then you have the iron thighs. And then you have this period of time where it's it's basically these intermingled, you know, iron and clay type of system that they're trying to kind of hold together, but they're not. It's just a very haphazard system. And then you have the rock that destroys it all. And you can see that these, it's kind of hard maybe to see on the video, but these metals coincide with various beast systems. And I'll zoom in a little bit. You can see basically that the, the lion and the bear, we'll get all this in just a second, and how these other systems fall in line. Because Daniel receives several visions. The, the statue was the big picture vision. And then he received vision of the four beasts, which we're going to get into. And these align very much the same way as the statue. And then you have kind of a minor vision, which is kind of the ram and the goat vision. And that also aligns with the four beasts. But again, it's these things are, how do we look at this? These things are basically all different pictures of the same thing. So when you have the statue, you have kind of like the layers of a cake, right? It's a prophetic cake of, of understanding. You have the layer, the first layer, which is kind of the foundation. And then you have another layer, another flavor. Think of it that's, that way. The four beasts kind of come back and, and paint the same order of kingdoms. This is the important thing. Okay, who is the head? The head is Babylon. So the vision is not about the Jewish empires or the Jewish iteration of empires. It's about Babylon. Babylon is the head. And then it, the kingdoms that are coming one after the other are kingdoms that are being used by God to judge the previous kingdom until he's going to judge all of them with his second return, or is his, basically the second coming of Christ or the return of Christ, which is the rock that destroys this entire system. But Babylon, we know what came after Babylon. Babylon being the gold, what came after it was Medo-Persia. The, the Persians conquered the Babylonians through Cyrus. And then you had the Greeks through Alexander the Great that conquered the Persians. And then you had Rome which conquered the Greeks. And, you know, all these, basically, all these world powers came one after the other. They are the major world powers that happened in the world, in that part of the world, which is what this vision is being concerned with, 
because basically all the world powers that came out of Babylon ruled all of Europe, all of Asia, you know, for the most part, I mean, all of the major territories. And then the final power was Rome, but Rome had another system that came out of it, which is the religio-political power of the papacy. This is kind of a, a, a union of church and state, a, a political religious power. Now, it doesn't say that in Daniel so much, you know, because ultimately it's a very generalized, big picture type of thing. We know the kingdoms that came out of, uh, out of Babylon or conquered Babylon were in that order. It was Babylon, Persia, uh, Greece, Rome, and then those are the four kingdoms. But then there's the fifth part of the statue, which is this iron mixed with clay. And if you look at kind of the history of the world, what happened after Rome, you know, Rome was divided up into 10 nations in 476 AD. As the empire basically crumbled under the weight of, you know, its own political instability and barbarian invasions and all these different things, it basically divided into 10 kingdoms. And that's pretty interesting because that basically coincides with the 10 European nations and how throughout history they tried to intermarry with one another to keep their power, but it didn't work for a variety of different reasons. Then they tried the European Union and NATO. And if you know anything about the European Union and the Tower of Babel as their inspiration for their headquarters, uh, you know, you know that they are very intentional about what they're doing. And so what does that tell you? That tell you that the spirit behind the European Union and NATO and all these different things is the same spirit that tried to build the Tower of Babel. Well, what was the Tower of Babel about? That was a new world order government trying to be initiated. Every single time that they have tried to make a new world order, God has brought judgment upon them. When Babylon became too arrogant that they controlled the world, that they're basically the new world order, the Persians were used and Babylon was destroyed. When Persia became the same way, then Alexander the Great was raised up and he conquered pretty much the entire known world at the time. And then Alexander the Great basically split off into four empires. His four generals took over once he died. And that's prophesied in one of the other visions as well, the ram and the goat vision. Then you had Rome. And then Rome basically split up into 10 empires. So you had basically this, this sequence of empires that, that was one after the other that judged the previous. And of course, we're now in that final iteration uh, where you have these 10 nation states, right? Basically the, the European Union, but really it's not just the European Union. It's the World Economic Forum. It's these globalist systems. And, you know, we will look into this in a future time, but they have tried to divide the world into 10 kingdoms, believe it or not. This was several decades ago. The World Economic Forum and all these globalist organizations, they divided the world into 10 kingdoms. And, you know, basically we're trying to do policy in that regard. Now, this isn't necessarily public information. You have to do dig or digging around it because they've tried to hide this information quite a bit. But they've tried to divide the world into 10 kingdoms. And so this is all in fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy of this, of this empire that basically continues. So here's the wisdom behind this, this statue, because it's all going to come together. The statue is one image. It's one statue, but it degrades over time. What does that tell you? That tells you that even though they're different empires, the values and ideals are the same. This is the brilliance about how God reveals the truth in, in visions and in these different prophetic situations. It's There's so much information packed in this simple vision of a statue. It's one system, one Babylonian ideal that continues through history. It's an ideal of rebellion to God. It's an ideal of arrogance. It's an ideal of materialism, idolatry, evil, persecuting God's people. But there's different flavors of it throughout time. And of course, we're living now in the final flavor, which you'll soon realize what that is. But basically, you have the entirety of history set by this statue vision. So if we keep that in mind, and we, again, use everything contextually and step by step. 
And we now go to the four beasts uh, vision, which is in Daniel 7. So Daniel 2 is the statue. Daniel 7 is the four beasts. So let's take a look at that. That's in Daniel 7 verses 1 through 8. This is Daniel's vision of the four beasts. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he, as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. And four great beasts come, came up out of the sea, different from one another. Now, the sea is representative for multitudes and nations and wicked people. So we'll look at where that's said in Revelation. But just keep that in mind. The sea is representative of multitudes, meaning very populated areas. Verse 4, the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. And the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth, between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, and with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had a great, it had great iron teeth. There's that vision of iron again. It devoured and broke it in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking great things. Okay, so then it goes to the Ancient of Days. There's a vision of the Ancient of Days where basically the Son of Man, which is Christ, comes before the Ancient of Days and receives dominion. This is was fulfilled at the Ascension. Um, and then there's an interpretation of the vision. So we'll get into that in just a second. But first impressions with this with this vision. A couple of things that we have to take note of. There are five kingdoms slash powers, just like there are five kingdoms slash powers in this vision of the statue. This was just a few chapters later. So again, the statue has gold, silver, brass or bronze, iron, and then iron mixed with clay. There's five iterations, five main segments. And we know that that's talking about Babylon and this Babylonian system that's going through time. Then you have the four beasts, which talk about, or, you know, five basically systems, because the fourth beast is the iron beast, which coincides with the iron, basically, thighs of the statue, which is an interesting correlation. But out of that fourth beast comes this little horn power, which is recognized as kind of the fifth power. So we have five kingdoms and powers on the, in the statue, and then five powers in the four beasts vision. There's four beasts, but then there's a fifth power that comes out of that fourth beast. So really there's five powers total. And so it's very clear that there are some correlations between these two visions. Now, could it be that the visions of the beasts are picking up where the statue gave the full account of history and just giving us more detail? I think so, and it's very probable that's the case because a lion with wings is a very indicative symbol of Babylon. Babylon had a lot of these lions with wings as their symbol, engraved in their ar architecture, engraved in their, their pictures and various kinds. So a lion with wings was very much a Babylonian symbol. And then you had bear, the, the bear after that with Medo-Persia. So you had basically three ribs in its mouth. It's devouring much flesh. Medo-Persia basically conquered everything at the time. Then you had leopards or a leopard with wings. Now wings represent speed and so does a leopard. And so we know that Alexander the Great, when he conquered everything, it was in a matter of 10 years. Then he died. It was a very brief situation, but he conquered pretty much the entire known world at the time. So it was very quick, very much like a leopard. And we know that after Alexander the Great died, 
his four generals basically inherited his kingdom and split the kingdom into four pieces. And so you have a leopard with wings, very quick, but then you have a leopard with four heads. That's really interesting, where you have basically an indica indication of four kingdoms, or four kings, I should say, after Alexander the Great passed away. But then after the leopard, you have this terrible beast that is associated with iron. Now, we know Rome perfected the use of iron. They were known for, one of the things they were known for is the perfection of the use of iron. And in the vision of the statue, Rome was the fourth kingdom. That makes sense. In the vision of the four beasts, Rome was the fourth beast as well because it's associated with iron. Which is very interesting also because this fourth beast, which is very terrible and devours everything, Rome is just brutal. Rome was absolutely just vicious and brutal and merciless. They invented crucifixion. They basically perfected torture and iron. So they're very terrible indeed. And, and they conquered all the known world. Now, out of that beast, we again see this system of 10 powers or 10 kingdoms. We know that, again, Rome split into 10 kingdoms in 476 AD. That's consistent with the statue that the, the, the iron system would split into iron mixed with clay. It's also consistent with the terrible beast, where you have 10 horns on this beast, 10 horns. The horn is a representative of a power, a king or a kingdom. And these 10 horns basically are on this beast. So they come out of this beast at some point in time. And that's pretty consistent because Rome eventually had 10 kingdoms. So as you can see, first impressions, there's a lot of similarities between the four beasts of Daniel and the statue. And again, we know the statue paints a picture of Babylon and the empires that followed it. And so all of these things start to fall together if you just let scripture interpret itself. Now, again, after this initial vision, Daniel receives like more visions of other things. The Son of Man is given dominion, and he's presented before the Ancient of Days. This happened after Christ's ascension. Christ ascended, he sat at the right hand of the Father of the power, and basically was given dominion over all things, so that he could rule amidst his enemies, while his enemies were put under his feet. Remember, the last enemy to, put, uh, to be put down is death. Now, that happens when Christ returns, because when Christ returns, everyone's going to be resurrected and given full, you know, uh, flawless bodies, basically, resurrection bodies. And so death will be destroyed as the last enemy. So that means we are in the millennial kingdom and that this vision of the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man being presented before it w was fulfilled at the Ascension. But in typical fashion throughout these visions, you have the, you know, kind of this, God gives you the bad news, like look at the big bad monsters that are on the horizon but then he gives you the good news that he's going to win and he's victorious. And so that's what happens here. You have the visions of the beasts, but then Daniel sees the Ancient of Days reigning. And in verse 11 through 12, we see a very important thing. So it says, I looked then because of the sound of the great words and the horn that was speaking. This was the fifth power, the final power that came out of Rome. And as I looked, the beast was killed and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives are prolonged for a season and a time. There's a lot in these two verses. First and foremost, compare this to Revelation 19, verse 20, where it says, And the beast was captured, and with the false prophet who was in his presence, and done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. Those were thrown alive into the lake of fire and burned with sulfur. And so, the judgment of the beast that Daniel saw is the same judgment that the beasts in Revelation receive, which is basically being burned with fire. They're destroyed. That's a symbol of judgment. Now, it says that another thing that's really important, which again ties these visions to the vision of the statue. As for the rest of the beasts, this is verse 12. <clears throat> As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So, what do you have here? You have these kingdoms that are taking over one another. You have Persia taking over Babylon. You have Greece taking over Persia. Their dominion was taken away. The beast's dominion was taken away. But their lives 
were prolonged for a season and a time. Now, I don't think this is a time prophecy because in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, it says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. So I believe that this is a an idiom, basically saying, you know, a season and a time, like their, their lives are prolonged for a while. Now, what is that while? Well it's, well, it's this entire period of history. And what does it mean that the lives of the empires was prolonged for a season and a time, even though their dominion was taken away? Well, what it means is this. In the statue, you have one statue, one system. They all share the same ideals, this Babylonian pagan system, this antichrist satanic system. But it just has different flavors throughout time. It degrades over time, too. Well, that's the same thing with these beasts. Even though their dominion was taken away, their lives, how does a beast live on? Well, if a beast is a kingdom and a power, a political power, its life continues through its ideals, through the things that people believe and the things that people do. And if you know anything about the history of these empires, you look at our own culture today, it's very much still Babylonian, Greek, Roman, all these ideals are still very prevalent in our society. And so their lives were prolonged, which is a consistent thing with the vision of the statue. It is one system with all these ideals, and it's just changing flavors and whoever is basically dominating. But how do we know this from just looking at our own culture? We know that in Babylon, they perfected centralized authoritarian rule. And this will all come into play with some of the things that John sees, because John's first beast that comes out of the sea is a conglomerate. It has these different aspects of these various beasts that Daniel sees. It has, you know, feet like a, a bear, I believe, and, the you know, parts of a leopard, parts of a lion. All these different things are basically all smushed together in John's first beast of the sea. So that's why it's important to understand these beasts that Daniel sees, because it all comes together. Now, we know Babylon represents central authoritarian rule. They, they perfected that. We know Medo-Persia developed taxes and basically accounting and bureaucracy, this bureaucratic type of system. And we have that certainly today with all the globalist push towards having a one world order and everybody being attractive, the social credit system. You have also Greece that had developed rapid military conquests and they they influenced people with their Greek philosophy, right? Gre Greco-Roman philosophy, Greco-Roman ideals, and same thing with Rome. You know, the, the, the pagan system and the pagan beliefs of Greece and Rome are very much alive and well today. And particularly in the true antichrist power of the earth, which is the Catholic Church. But we'll get to that. And so the point is this, these beasts were allowed to live despite their dominion being taken away. And they're allowed to live for a season at a time until the end, until the very end, because it's a conglomerate system. So all of this is consistent with the vision of the statue. It's getting more and more consistent. But now let's look at the interpretation of this vision. And this is found in Daniel 7, verses 15 through 26. And it reads, As for me, Daniel, my spirit within me was anxious, and the visions of my head alarmed me. I approached one of those who stood there and asked him the truth concerning all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of the things. These four great beasts are four kings who shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever. So again, it's giving you the bad news, but then it gives you the good news. This is a pattern throughout these visions. Verse 19. Then I desired to know the truth about the fourth beast which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and claws of bronze, which devoured and broke in pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. And about the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn that came up before which three of them fell, the horn that had eyes and a mouth that, sp that spoke great things, and that seemed greater than its companions. As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. So we have a persecuting power until the Ancient of Days came, and judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. So this power is persecuting people until the very end. That's the point. 
Verse 23, thus he said, as for the fourth beast, there shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. So the beast is the kingdom. Therefore, the previous beasts are also kingdoms, even though they have kings. Which shall be different from all the kingdoms, and it shall devour the whole earth and trample it down and break it to pieces, which Rome definitely did. As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings shall arise, and another shall arise after them. He shall be different from the former ones and shall put down three kings. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall think to change times and the law. And this shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. This is a period of 1260 days, which is 1260 years. Verse 26, But the court shall sit in judgment and his dominion shall be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And so you have this power now that's being identified very, very specifically. As if there were any doubt, now God really clears it up for us. Now, the fourth, let's take this step by step. The fourth kingdom is a beast, and just like the other, or sorry, the fourth beast is a kingdom, just like all the other beasts, they're all kingdoms. It has claws of bronze and teeth of iron. So these are reminiscent of Greco, again, Greco Roman. Romans really built off the Greeks, but you had these Greco Roman ideals and paganism and everything else that Rome had. Rome really built off of that and perfected it. Now, of course, iron matches Rome because that's very clear with the statue and also history. Rome perfected iron. But you have the ten horns that are ten kings. And we know, again, that Rome split into ten kingdoms in 476. But you have this little horn power that is so indicative and it clarifies everything because we know that the little horn will will subdue three previous kings. And this happened in history. We'll look at how that happened in history. It's going to speak great words against God, blasphemies against God, and persecute the saints. It's going to think to change times and laws. This is a very specific prophecy. Because first and foremost, every king that's ever been has always changed things like that. They've always changed. They always had their own calendars. They've always had their own various governmental laws. And so is this... Is this stating the obvious is the question, or is this talking about some specific time and specific law? And so the point is, it wouldn't be saying the obvious because every king does that. Every king changes times and laws to some degree for their kingdom. This is talking about God's law and God's time. And there is no power on earth that has ever fulfilled that better than the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church changed the Sabbath And the Catholic Church also changed the calendar. We have the Gregorian calendar, which was set up by Pope Gregory in, I believe, 1400 or 1500 sometime. But the papacy did both, changed times and laws. And we also know that the saints are going to be given into this power's hand for 1260 days, which is really 1260 years. Now, remember, again, the 70 weeks prophecy, day to your principle. All of these things are tied together because this vision in Daniel that he has is tied to the 2300 year prophecy. It's a 2300 year slot of time that encompasses these various things happening, the beasts, the little horn power, and so on. And so we know in verse 24 also that he's going to be different from the rest. This little horn power is going to be different from the rest. So how is he different? Well, if all of these were political powers in the past, the one thing that's different about this power, which happens to be the papacy, and again, we'll we'll tie this over and over again. This little horn power is a religio-political power. The papacy did not have a military of its own. It controlled other militaries. It was a religious political power that basically was from behind the scenes. It was controlling everything. And we know that in verse 8, it says he'll have the eyes of a man. And so this power will have a representative. And of course, we know that the papacy has its own king, its own pope, right? The pope is basically the king. He's the, the bishop of Rome. He has a represent, the papacy has a representative. So the little horn, which is a power, a king, a kingdom, has its representative and that's the Pope. And that's that's very clear. Now we know the horn is a king or a kingdom. We know from verse 24, 
As for the ten horns, out of this kingdom ten kings shall arise. So a king is a horn. It's very important. We also know later in Daniel 8, verse 21 through 22, we'll get to this in the next series of visions, and the goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between his eyes is the first king. So horns are kingdoms, or sorry, horns are kings, uh, but it also can be a kingdom, right? So the important thing is you have kind of both that's happening here. We know that the little horn, it's a little horn, we know that Vatican is its own kingdom. We know the Vatican is its own separate city-state that is under its own sovereign rule, and yet it has so much power. So it's a tiny little place, and yet it has so much, the tiny kingdom, its own little kingdom that controls so many other kingdoms. And we also know, again, that it has a pope as a representative. So this fulfills very clearly this whole time period, because again, you have a time stamp. You have 1260 years. And we know that the papacy was from 538 AD to 1798 when it was when the Pope was arrested by Napoleon. And basically the papacy seemed like it came to an end. We talked all about this in the previous episode. And the papacy was established in 538 AD. That's 1260 years to the day. And we know that the papacy persecuted God's people. It made the sanctuary desolate. We looked at all of this in the previous couple episodes with the daily, the abomination of desolation. It's the papacy time and again. All roads lead to Rome. You have to remember that. So, a couple thoughts on all this before we look at the ram and the goat vision. Both the statue and the beasts outline four kingdoms in the same order. They both have a fifth kingdom that is post-Rome that has 10 divisions in it, 10 kings, 10 kingdoms, and so on. So they're very similar in that regard. Both visions have a judgment on the last kingdom, and it's they're both burned in the same way, or smashed in, in the case of the statue. But both visions portray this series of empires, and then at the very end, they get judged. It's very clear that they're, they're judged at the end of time when Christ returns. So that's very clear. The little horn is tied to a time prophecy. We know that. 1260 years. And again, this is where dispensationalism gets it wrong because it reads these 1260 year time periods as literal days, which is really three and a half years. And that's incorrect because it's all tied to the 2300 year prophecy. It's all tied to the 70 weeks prophecy. And if you understand the 70 weeks, then everything that's in that 2300-year prophecy, which is the 70 weeks, the 1260-day prophecy, there's some other time prophecies we haven't even mentioned, like the 1335 and the 1290. Those are a little more minor, but it's all really the same period of time. It's really this long period of time where the saints are being given into the Antichrist power's hand, that the papacy, the little horn power, was the longest empire out of all of these. 1260 years is a long time. And people don't study their history to know what happened with the Inquisition, the Crusades, indulgences, you know, banning the Bible, killing people who were Bible-believing Christians. There's no other power in history that even comes close to fulfilling these prophecies like the Catholic Church does. So you have to know your history. But let's put this on the back burner now and look at the ram and the goat vision. This is in Daniel 8, so it's the next chapter over. And this is where all of these things kind of come together. Again, you have to read all of these. You have to read all of them. Take them all into consideration because there's pieces of information that come into play that make things very clear. Okay, so in Daniel 8 is where we find out about this 2300-year prophecy. And the 2300-year prophecy, Daniel receives these visions. He's, he's confused. He doesn't understand it. This is in Daniel 8, which we're about to read. And then in Daniel 9, he asks for clarity. And that's where he gets the 70 weeks prophecy, which again proves that all of these things that he just saw with time periods are to be understood in a prophetic way, meaning day-to-year principle. The time periods that he saw are years, not days. And so this is where we understand that in Daniel 8, because it all ties into this 2300-year prophecy. All these visions that we saw, the little horn, 
with 1260 days, it's tied into the 2300 day prophecy. So let's take a look at that. This is the ram and the goat vision. It's not as prolific as the other visions where, you know, you have the statue and the four beasts is kind of this long, continuous series of time. Whereas the ram and the goat is more specifically about Persia and Greece. But it also talks about the little horn too, which is interesting. So let's take a look. This is in Daniel 8, and we're going to start with verse 3. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram with two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great toward the south, toward the east, toward the, toward the glorious land. It was great, even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. So we see it seeing some similar imagery. Verse 11, it was great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering, now remember, this is the, the ESV I'm reading here in the KJV. It translates this as the daily. We'd had a whole episode on this. And by him, the daily was taken away. Now ESV translates, translates this as the regular burnt offering was taken away from him. But it's not what this is talking about. The daily was taken away, and we had a whole episode about this, so go check it out if you haven't seen it. And the place of his sanctuary was so overthrown. Verse 12, And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering, or the daily, because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground, and it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to the one who spoke, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the daily, the transgression that makes desolate, the giving over the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? So how long is all of these things that I just saw? Like, how? what's the time period? And he said to me, for 2300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. So Daniel sees this and he at the end of this vision, I believe, if you look at verse 27, he says, I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and I did not understand it. This is later in the chapter, but basically Daniel didn't understand these visions. They were confusing, especially the 2300 days. Like what's going on with this vision of 2300 days, which really is 2300 years. In the next chapter in Daniel 9, is when Gabriel comes back, gives him some wisdom, reveals the 70 weeks prophecy of the Messiah as a chunk of this 2300 year prophecy. Why is all this important? Because the 70 weeks is a day to year prophecy. That means that the 2300 days, since this was a chunk of the 2300 days, obviously it can't be literal days if that one is 490 years, the, the 2300 days is actually 2300 years. Do you see how all this works? And because the 2300 years was mentioned in context of all these things that he just saw with the, the ram and the goat and then the little horn again, right? So this is kind of piecing together some of the things he saw previously. He saw, again, the ram and the goat. And then he saw these this little horn power that, again, is blaspheming, is persecuting the saints. It's throwing truth, truth to the ground. And we talked about the daily, so go look into that and how basically the daily represents. It could represent two things. I think it rep could represent both pagan Rome being overthrown, uh, which is like the continual, right? The continuance of these uh, pagan empires. 
which the, the papacy overthrew, it basically disrupted this continual, the, the, the word for daily is continual. That's why it's not the regular burnt offering. That's not what it says. It just says the daily, the continual was taken away. Now, this could be in context of the gospel, the ministry of Christ on earth, not in heaven, obviously, because that's what happened with papal Rome. People didn't go to the gospel. They, the sanctuary was made desolate. And so it could fulfill both. But there's a whole episode on that. Go check it out if you haven't seen it. The point is this. All these things, we went from like short term, like Persia and Greece right, which is a few hundred years after Daniel, to then suddenly zoom out to the little horn and then 2,300 days, 2,300 years, right? So it's a, it's a zoom in, zoom out type of prophecy. And you have this throughout scripture where you have something that, you, that you're being described and then it's a zoom out type of situation. So you have to pay attention and use context. You have to use context. And in this case, the context is all the things we've been talking about. You had the statue which paints a clear picture of a succession of empires or powers. Then you had the four beasts plus the little horn, which we saw again matches the statue. It's the five powers that are basically going through history. Now you have this vision, which again has similarities. We know that Medo-Persia was after Babylon and Medo-Persia was like a, a dual empire. So you had a horn you had the ram with two horns. Remember, horns are kings and kingdoms. So they had two kings and two kingdoms. And then you had Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great was called Alexander the Great. And isn't that funny how in verse 21, it says, and the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king. Who was the first king of Greece? It was Alexander the Great. And the goat started with like a unicorn, like a basically a long, a great horn, who was Alexander the Great. And then it was basically uh, killed, you know, it was burst. And then four horns came out of that, which were the four generals that ruled Alexander the Great's empire. But it's very clear that this succession of empires, Medo-Persia and Greece, it follows what we saw with the four beasts and it follows what we saw with the statue. So it doesn't talk about Babylon. It doesn't talk about Rome. After that, it just kind of skips to the papacy, which is this little horn power. It's reiterating this little horn power. Why? Because God is giving the big view, the 2300 year prophecy, which is going to include other prophecies after that, the, the 70 weeks, the 1260 days and other things that are happening. So we have the, the zoom out view after that. And Remember, this is focusing on Medo Persia and Greece, but then it goes to the papacy, which matches all the little horn things we saw in Daniel 7. So let's look at how the little horn in Daniel 8 is very similar to the little horn in Daniel 7. And I, I want to draw these parallels because there are many, many parallels. So it's obviously talking about the same thing. Now, both are called a little horn. In Daniel 8, verse 9, it says, Out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great. And then in Daniel 7, verses 8, it says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one. So it's talking about the same type of thing that he saw, which is unlikely if these are two different powers. Now, let's look at Daniel 7, a couple of things. In verse 21, it says he's going to make war with the saints. As I looked, his horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. In verse 8, I consider the horns, and behold, there came up among them a little horn, and behold, in his, in his eyes were the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. So it's, it's persecuting the saints, it's speaking great things, as in blasphemies. You have in verse 19 of chapter 7, uh, is exceedingly dreadful, right? So you have basically, then I desire to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the rest, exceedingly terrifying with its teeth of iron and bronze, which devoured and broke it in pieces. So it's very terrifying type of thing. In verse 11 of chapter 7, I looked in them because of the sound of the great words the horn was speaking. And as I looked, the beast was killed and his body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. So it was judged for basically its blasphemies and all the things that it spoke. Now in Daniel 8, keep all that in mind, 
Let's look at what the little horn does in Daniel 8. In verse 24, his power shall be great, but not by his own power. Remember, the papacy didn't have its own military. It was a political, religio-political power, not a religio-military power. It was a religious political power that manipulated other militaries to do its will. And he shall cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. So he's destroying the saints, just like in Daniel 7, he's making war with the saints. Same kind of thing. But in this, we get a little detail that we didn't get in Daniel 7, which is that it's not by his own power. And this is very important because the papacy didn't have his own military power, and yet it was a world power. Very interesting how that happened. Verse 11 of Daniel 8, It became great, even as great as the prince of the host, and the regular, or the daily, was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. So we looked at the abomination of desolation, we looked at the daily, very clear how the papacy fulfilled that by basically making the plan of salvation desolate, Nobody entered through the door anymore because the church had become the authority through all of its pagan practices. Now, in verse 23 of chapter 8, we see a king of fierce countenance. At the, at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. Now, in the KJV, it says a king of fierce countenance. And, of course, I compare that to the exceedingly dreadful that we see in Daniel 7. So it's kind of the same thing, this fierce, dreadful power. And in verse 25 of chapter 8, we're kind of bouncing back and forth, but it all paints the same picture. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand, and in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes. Who is that? That's Jesus. And he shall be broken, but by no human hand. Now, take note of this, by no human hand... Remember the vision of the statue where, what did Daniel see? He saw a stone that was cut by no human hand that came and destroyed this statue. Final, this, the final system, it destroyed it, and with it, all these other iterations that were basically carried over through the ideals, through the Babylonian and Roman and Gre- Greco-Roman ideals. So when Christ returns, he's going to put an end to this system. And Christ is signified by the rock, which throughout scripture relates to Jesus. And in the vision that Daniel received, it was the rock that destroyed these kingdoms. So it's very clear that we're talking about Jesus and the return of Jesus. Now, the rock was cut by no human hands, which again points to the divinity of Christ. And in in this verse here in chapter 8, verse 25 of Daniel 8, and, and the vision of the ram and the goat, he shall be broken, but not by no human hand. So put it, put one and one together. Who is doing the breaking? Who is doing the judging? It's very clear that we're talking about the same power. God is giving us a zoomed out view of this final power, which is the papacy and its many iterations, and how it's going to be judged. It's going to be judged when Christ returns because this is the final system. Now, John picks up on this and gives us a little more detail as how this final system has various iterations. But Daniel didn't know that, that or even the visions that Daniel did receive were kind of over his head. He didn't really understand them at first. And so he's giving us the general view. And the general view is that the papacy, which is the little horn power, is going to be in control until the end of time when Christ returns and destroys this entire system. Now, other details about the little horn in Daniel 8. In verse 8, uh, chapter 8, verse 10, it says, It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host of some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. Now we know from later in Daniel 12, verse 3, that the stars are believers. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So the saints are compared to stars, and so if this power is throwing the stars down and trampling on them, what is it doing? It's trampling on the saints. Who did that in history? It's very clear. We also know in another New Testament end times chapter, Luke 21, that Jerusalem's going to be trampled. Verse 24, they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among nations, 
and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, this is talking about, of course, the physical thing that happened. But remember, there are physical things that point to spiritual realities. Yes, Jerusalem was trampled in 70 AD. The temple was destroyed. <coughs> Excuse me. And we know that that was a foreshadowing of something much greater spiritually, which is the spiritual Jerusalem, God's people, the body of believers being trampled by the Antichrist power, which was the papacy. And we saw that in the two witnesses. It all ties together. It's the same thing. You're looking at one reality through different keyholes. And you see different things when you look through the different keyholes. And each prophecy paints a different picture. It doesn't give you everything, all the details in one prophecy. And that's why you have to read them in context with one another. But in Daniel 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 11, we know that the daily was taken away. Now, again, in ESV, this translated as a regular burnt offering, uh, was taken away from him in the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. His sanctuary is talking about the prince of the host in verse 11. Okay, so remember from the abomination of desolation, where the plan of salvation is pictured in the physical sanctuary that the Jews had during the wilderness and before they built their temple. Even the temple itself was a symbol of the plan of salvation that God was going to inaugurate through the Messiah. It was a spiritual reality. And so when Daniel saw that the sanctuary was being trampled, again, 2,300 years, the, the sanctuary ceased to be important at the cross. The veil was torn in two, then 40 years later, the temple was destroyed. If this vision of 2,300 years is talking about the physical sanctuary, then that's impossible because the sanctuary became obsolete and was destroyed less than 2,300 years after Daniel saw this. And it's not talking about the sanctuary in heaven, as some people believe. Seventh-day Adventists believe this because the sanctuary in heaven, nothing of any prophetic text is talking about things that happen in heaven. Prophecy is about what happens on earth, things that concern us in history, not in heaven. This is talking about the plan of salvation and how the Antichrist power was basically trotting it underfoot. And that's true. From 321 AD, when Constantine married religion and politics together into one system, and then later 538 AD, when the papacy finally assumed power, and all the way till 1798, when the Pope was arrested, that was a dominating period of time where Christianity was, true Christianity, was persecuted, subdued by its own kind. And remember that the Antichrist, the only time it's the son of perdition is mentioned in connection to the Antichrist, the only time that term is mentioned in the Bible is with Judas. Judas was an insider. He was a believer or a fake believer, but he was basically part of the fold. He was close to Jesus and he was the treasurer. Now think about that for a moment. If the Antichrist, if that's supposed to be a picture of the Antichrist, or the Antichrist power, then the Antichrist power is very close to, seemingly close, let's put it that way, it's seemingly close to Christ, but it's actually a Judas. And not only that, but it's the treasurer. The Vatican is has been responsible for all the wealth practically in the world, and it's very much close to Jesus on face value, but it's actually a Judas. And so all these things come together. There's no other power in history that fulfills these things. But again, you have to read them in context of one another. In verse 24, one more is that his power shall be great, but not by his own power. Again, we talked about this, but the papacy doesn't have its own military. Now it has the Jesuits, which we'll talk about. And we talked about it last episode with the art of war, how the Jesuits are pretty much <laughs> like the military wing of the Vatican, but the military slash propaganda wing. But the Pope himself and the Vatican doesn't have an overt military. It doesn't have an overt territory. It's a little tiny sovereign city in Rome. And yet this little city controls the world, which is very fascinating. So let's put it all together. All the, all the visions that we've seen so far, we had the, the Nebuchadnezzar's dream. We had the four beasts. We had the two beasts. 
of the ram and the goat. So Nebuchadnezzar's dream plus the four beasts of Daniel show the same timeline. They're pretty consistent. Then you have the ram and the goat vision, which confirms the order of empires. Now, it doesn't talk about all the empires, but it confirms that it was Medo-Persia, then Greece. Again, it's talking about the same things. It's not talking about Jewish empires. It's not talking about anything else. It's very clear that the order of empires that we established with the statue was reflected again in the four beasts, and then again in the ram and the goat vision. It's talking about the same things because it's painting different details in each one. You notice, for example, the little horn power in Daniel 8. It mentions the detail that it's not by his own power, which is a very important detail. You don't see that in Daniel 7. And so that's why this is talking about the same thing, but just giving it another shade, another contour, another flavor. The beasts are the kingdoms and kings that are coming throughout history. They're not people, individuals, they're political powers. Now, beasts come out of the sea. I mentioned this previously, and we know from Revelation 17, 15, that the beasts, that the sea represents multitudes. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And in Isaiah 5, 57, 20, but the wicked are like the tossing sea, for it cannot be quiet, and its waters toss up mire and dirt. So you have peoples and nations and wicked people representing the sea. And of course, in Revelation, you also have images of the sea being calm, or they're not being sea, which represents really not that it should be taken literally that there won't be any water in the eternal state, but rather that there's not going to be chaos and tribulation and the, these unruly, rebellious people, right? And so the, the sea is representative of people. So when you see beasts coming out of the sea, which both Daniel and John see, it's a representation of beasts of political powers coming out of densely populated areas of where there's a lot of people and chaos and wickedness. And that's true for all the empires that we talked about. Now, we also looked at the little horn, how it's personified as a power with a person at its head. And it has a lot of things in common. It persecutes the saints. It has a certain time that it's allowed to be, which is 1260 years, which perfectly aligns with the papacy. And we know that it's going to be judged at the very end when Christ returns. This is consistent with the statue. This is consistent with Daniel's vision of the four beasts in Daniel 7 and in Daniel 8 when it talks about the little horn being judged. It's all the same timeline. Now, of course, God gives us the big picture through all these different visions, and we put them together, and we see kind of the same sequence of events. Now, if we go to that end times timeline that we uh, constructed, again, if you're listening to this, feel free to check it out. It's in the description. I'm going to try to zoom in here, but basically, you have the statue, and you can see this statue spans pretty much all of human history. So the rock represents whenever the second coming of Christ will be. And throughout that, you have the four beasts. You have the lion, the bear, the leopard. You had the terrible beast. And of course, there are details in each chapter that we don't see in other chapters. In this case, with the four beasts, you have three, uh, you have three horns that we didn't talk about. We'll talk about it in a future episode where how basically there, there was the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. There were three kingdoms that were removed by the papacy. And that fulfills the vision in Daniel. But that happened within the same time period of this iron mixed with clay, which is the 10 European nations, which is the 10 Roman kingdoms. It's all the same stuff. The little horn and the 10 European nations, the iron mixed with clay. It's all the same time period. Now, of course, you also have Daniel's vision of the, the ram and the goat. You have basically the Middle Persians, Alexander the Great, which is a very small time period. But then you have the goat with four horns, which is most of the Greek, the Greek empire with his four generals that created the uh, Ptolemaic kingdom, the Seleucid empire, the Pergamum, and Macedonia, I believe. So you had that, but then it, again, it goes, it skips into the bigger picture, which is out of these, out of this system, out of this ram with four horns, what happened? Well, you had a horn that came out of it that basically matches the description of the little horn. Now, of course, in this vision, it skips the terrible beast, 
But we can say by the succession that, yes, eventually the little horn did come out of these systems. It's all one system. Remember, the, the beasts were allowed to carry on for a time and a season, meaning they were allowed to carry on even though their dominion was taken away. So everything is continuous regardless. So this system of the little horn came out and it matches the same period and description of the little horn in the four beasts. So everything is consistent. Again, you can get lost with history on this, but it's all consistent. If you remember the abomination of desolation, if you remember the daily, it's all consistently pointing to the same persecuting power, the two witnesses in Revelation. It's all the same persecuting power. The 1260 years keeps pointing to the papacy's dominion, which we see in history. Now, in Revelation 13, you have the first beast, and it comes out of the sea. So again, sea is represented from multitudes and nations. And I saw a first beast rising out of the sea. This is Revelation 13. With ten horns and seven heads. With ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. So right away, you should recognize this ten horns thing from previous visions. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. And its feet were like a bear's. And its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Now isn't that interesting? Right away, again, you should see that this mirrors or reflects some of the things that Daniel saw. And to it, the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of his heads seemed to have a mortal wound. We talked about that in the last episode. But its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. And it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. Very similar stuff. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it, everyone whose name was not written, before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. So, right away we see, hopefully you see a lot of similarities between this and the little horn power that we just looked at in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. First off, it comes out of the sea, so it comes from a very populated area. It has leopard, which is Greece. It has bear, Middle Persia. And it has lion, which is Babylon. It has aspects from all those empires. Now, if you remember, again, the empire's lives will be extended, even though their dominion was taken away. So these, the statue, the four beasts, it testifies to this continuation of one ideal, one system, one antichrist power, really. Now, ten horns, this beast has ten horns. It's just, it's just like the ten horns in Daniel 7, just like the ten toes in the a vision of the statue in Daniel 2. It's all the same thing. It blasphemes God. It makes war with the saints. It overcomes them for 1260 days, which is 1260 years, just like the thing in Daniel 7, the little horn power in Daniel 8. Same power, same action, same time stamp. It has to be the same thing. So if little horn matches the description of the first beast, then the first beast equals the little horn. And we know that the little horn is the papacy. The first beast that that John sees is the papacy. It's the papal power that dominates the world for 1260 years. Now let's look at the second beast. Revelation 13 verses 11 through 16. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. Uh-oh. This is the first time that we've seen a beast come out of the earth. If the sea represents multitudes and great and people and nations and wickedness and basically a populated area, there's a lot of people a beast that comes out of the earth is a place that's not very populated. But what world power came out of a place that wasn't very populated? Hmm. We'll find out. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast 
that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. To be slain. Also, it causes all, both great and small, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless it has the mark, that is, the name of the beast, the number of its name. So, a lot going on in here, but who is the second beast? Well, it came out of the earth, so it wasn't a political power, wasn't necessarily coming from a very populated area, we know that, versus the sea. We know it looks like a lamb, the only... The only v- importance of a lamb in visions is relating to Jesus, Christianity. So it looks like Christianity, but it speaks like a dragon, which is satanic. Meaning, how does a power, how does a political power speak? Well, it writes laws. That's how it speaks. Now, two horns that it has, it could be indicative of political and religious power, meaning it's it exercises all the power of the first beast. The first beast had what? The first beast was a religio-political power. It was it had control over religion and over politics. There was no ch- separation between church and state. So this power that looks like Christianity but is actually satanic or luciferian exercises the first power the power of the first beast, meaning it has religio-political power. So that's what the two horns could mean. Now the two horns could also mean two leaders, president and vice president perhaps or two parties, maybe Democrat and Republican. Now, if you haven't guessed, this political power that arose out of basically nowhere and yet exercises the power of the first beast, which makes it a world power, is the United States. It's America. It's the country that seems like a Christian country, but it's actually Luciferian. And we're going to unpack this very deeply in a future episode because it requires quite a lot of breakdown. We're going to look at the founding fathers. We're going to look at the image of the beast, that this system acting like a false prophet, getting people to make an image. An image is a representation. So if a political system gets people to make a representation of the first beast, what's really happening is this political system, which looks like a lamb but speaks like a dragon, will create a world system that represents the first system that it was, the first beast, which was a political religious union, a Christian nationalist union, a neo-fascist system that pays homage to the original beast. And by doing so, it will convince the world to do just that. And by doing that, the system of the, the first beast system will be in control yet again. And that's exactly what we see in the final vision that John has, which is the woman riding the beast. But we'll get into all of this a lot more deeply. We know that this lamb-like system will deceive people using great signs and wonders. And there's a whole episode we'll talk about this, but consider this. Consider all of the Protestant things that are coming out of America. Charismatic, the prosperity gospel, passion of the Christ, uh, you know, all these false miracles and false signs and wonders and apps to get you to go back on the Catholic religion through Hallow. There's so much. Gosh, you know, shows on Netflix, Pure Flicks. It's all coming to a head. The, the division between church and state is not there. It really isn't. And I intend to prove that to you very thoroughly. But the image of the beast is being built as we speak. It's not AI, it's not some actual idol, it is a system that's being built that will pay homage and honor to the first beast by creating a Christian nationalist, a neo-fascist system. And we're going to be deceived into that system. Now, you and I are not going to be deceived because you know the truth, but most people will be deceived. It's a representation of something when you create an image. And so a political system acting like a false prophet, meaning it will bring people back to the beast. It will bring people back to the Catholic Church and make people believe that it's a good thing for the Catholic Church to be in charge. And it's a good thing to have a Christian nationalist system. Do you see what's going on around us today? Do you see the fact that 
we're, we're swinging from hardcore left to hardcore right, and that's by design. We're going to get into all of this. I mean, it's just too much to talk about in this episode, but we're moving in the direction of a Christian nationalist system, and that will happen, and it will be the image that will pay homage to the beast, and that image will speak, meaning it will legislate. And what's it going to legislate? Well, it's going to legislate that you can't buy or sell unless you take the mark of the beast of the first beast. What's the mark of the first beast? We'll get into that too. It's not a chip in your hand and it's not anything physical. It's a spiritual reality. And so all of these things are very plain when you see who the true antichrist power on the earth is. And when you understand history and when you stop looking at Israel, Israel, Israel for Bible prophecy. But I digress. Revelation 17 is the final vision that John has of this of this beast system. Remember, John picks up where the little horn leaves off and he he sees more detailed things about the persecution and the final iteration of these systems. Revelation 17, verses 1 through 6, the great prostitute and the beast. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came to him and said to me, come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters. Again, waters is peoples and multitudes, so that she is in control of that with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on the earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. Again, same thing as that first beast, same kind of characteristics, similar. Verse 4, the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Gosh, that's interesting and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup of of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, of mystery Babylon. This is ESV translates, just different. KJV says, was written mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, Why do you marvel when I tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and the ten horns that carries her? So we'll get into that in a second. But a couple first thoughts. Compare this to Revelation 12, verse 1, where you have the woman and the dragon. The woman is fleeing the dragon. The woman is representative of the church. And again, it's that same period, the 1260-year period. The woman is fleeing from the dragon. The two witnesses, God's word, 1260 years, the little horn, 1260 years, the the first beast, 1260 years. Do you see how it's all the same thing? I mean, it really can't be clear, but it does take some studying and piecing it together from different aspects. But once you piece it together, it's, it's really clear. But a woman represents the church. And so a, a prostitute, a harlot, represents an apostate church. Now, this church wears scarlet and gold and... You know, it's got purple. It's so all these things are indicative of royalty and wealth. Now compare this to, it's all very interesting because again, God is very specific. Compare these colors, so purple and scarlet, to the colors of the tabernacle. We know that the tabernacle on the inside has scarlet and purple during the sanctuary when the sanctuary was being built in the Old Testament because that was representative of Christ's divinity. And... Of course, who wears scarlet and purple? The Catholic Church does. The cardinals and the bishops wear scarlet and purple. And they have gold. They're very wealthy. It's one of the, it's the wealthiest power on the face of the earth. And so that's very interesting because, again, it's pretending to be Christian. The apostate church is wearing scarlet and purple, pretending to be Christian, pretending to serve Christ, but in reality, it's a Judas. Now, the name written on her forehead was Mystery Babylon. Again, this ties back to all the things we've been saying, that it's a continuation of the Babylonian system. The statue degenerates from gold to silver to brass to iron to iron mixed with clay. The beasts are moving and and consuming one another until you have this final little horn power, which is the final power that gets judged. But Daniel doesn't see all the iterations within that little horn. That's where John picks up. John picks up with the first beast, and that's the little horn power. And and the second beast, which is America, 
acting as a false prophet and bringing people back into this idea that having a Christian nationalist state, having a union of religion and politics is a good thing. That's what America's role is in prophecy. Now, that sounds pretty crazy if you've heard it for the first time. So I encourage you to stick with me. I'm not going to talk about it in this episode. There's going to be future episodes where we're going to talk about how all of this makes sense. And it really does. It's profound and pretty striking is how it makes sense. But I need a lot more time to talk about it. So I'm not going to mention it here. But America is the false prophet system that came out of the earth, meaning nowhere. It wasn't very populated in North America. And it became a world power that exercised the, the power of the first beast. Basically, I mean, America is the world power in the last, you know, 250 years, basically. So you have very similar things happening, but basically this idea of mystery Babylon, this, this woman riding the beast is the final power. Now we know she's drunk with the blood of the saints. She's a perse persecuting power. It's the same power. It's the little horn power, but it's an iteration within that little horn. These are nuances because again, God wants us to know where we are in history. History, historical lens, the historical lens is the best way and the only way really to look at Bible prophecy. Because if you're a futurist, you're not understanding where you are in history. And everything is read literally, so it's incorrect, obviously. Dispensationalism is incorrect. We've proven that over and over again. And if you're a preterist, that's probably even more dangerous because you think that Bible prophecy doesn't concern you. Because everything happened in the past. Oh, it's just the Jews again. They whatever happened with Israel and in, in the Old Testament or whatever, that the Jerusalem temple, that was the final thing that happened, doesn't need to concern us. There's no Antichrist. Now, if you were the devil and you wanted to fool people into basically not looking at their present surroundings and what's happening, that's exactly what you'd do. Remember, the devil is a master of duality. He takes the truth and he spins it either to the right or to the left. Either you're a futurist or a preterist, but God forbid that you see the truth by looking at history so you understand you are in it right now and the Antichrist system is all around you and it's about to take control. But it's the same power. We know over and over again it's pointing to the papacy, verses 1 through 6 of Revelation 17, very clearly pointing to the same thing over and over again. But let's read Revelation 7 through 11. The angel said to me, Why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Now that's an interesting statement. We'll come back to that. This calls for mind for wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain uh, only a little while. As for the beast that was and is not and is to come, he is the eighth, but it belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. Okay. And there's a little more with which we'll talk about with the ten horns because that's kind of in the future. So there's a lot going on here. A couple things. The beast that was and is not and is and yet is. That's very clearly talking about the beast that got the mortal wound, that seemed to have the mortal wound. So it was, then it was not, and then the mortal mortal wound was healed, and people wondered after the beast, wow, it's back in power. Yes, let's all worship the beast. And that's exactly what's going to happen. Now, the woman sits on seven mountains. This is so telling. There's only one place in the world that has seven mountains. And it's, in fact, called the city of seven hills. And that's Rome. And we know the woman represents an apostate church. So what apostate church sits on seven mountains? That's the Vatican. That's the Catholic Church. Now, there's only one other place besides that that could say that has seven mountains. And that's Istanbul. And if you know, Istanbul used to be Constantinople, which is where the original fusion of church and state happened in 321 AD. So either way you slice it, the apostate church that sits on seven mountains is identified with Rome. There's no other candidate, if you're being honest. So if that's the case, now it all makes sense. 
absolutely make sense. And we can all work back. We can even work backwards and see how all of these things we talked about were true. That the Roman power that came out of the fourth beast is the little horn power, which is the papacy, which is the first beast out of the sea, and so on. And this beast is going to come back into full power. This is what it's warning us against. And we are headed there People don't realize it. Now, it talks about seven kings, five have fallen, one is yet to come. There's a few theories about this we'll discuss this, but in either case, they all point to the same situation. That's the thing to remember. Just like the daily, just like the abomination of desolation, just like all these things, it all points to the same power, the papacy. The beast itself is the eighth, but he's part of the same, meaning he's he's part of this anti system. The woman riding the beast is an image of the final fusion of the church-state power. It's going to be a religio-political power, just as it was. That's what we're moving into. This whole idea of separation in church and state, it's a dialectic. It's a dialectic to bring people back into unification of church and state. And well, again, there's, there's a lot to talk about this, but for now, just take it on face value. So, obviously... The woman riding the beast, that's the final iteration. Seven mountains, she sits, is the seven mountains of Rome, city of seven hills. It's the papacy coming back in full force. And we're moving in that direction. But let's continue on reading from verse 12 onward. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them. For the Lord is Lord, for the He is Lord of Lord and King of Kings, and those with Him are called and chosen and faithful. And the angel said to me, "The waters that you saw, where the prostitutes seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages." We read that one previously. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked, and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. And God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Gosh, a lot of things in here. First and foremost, the great city is what? What great city has dominion over the earth? It's the Vatican. The Vatican is the only city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Now, we are not at the point where the kings of the earth, the ten kings, the kingdoms, remember the the, uh, the ten kingdoms, basically, that are divided up in the world that have given their power to the beast. We haven't gotten to that point yet. Now, whether it's an hour, as in a prophetic hour, right, which would be two weeks, I believe, or an hour as in like a period of time, doesn't matter. The point is, what's going to happen is, the kings of the earth will give their power to this one world system, this one world religio system, where the Pope will see him as the savior, the moral authority, and they're going to be convinced to fight against Christ, and they'll lose, and because of that, they're going to devour the beast. They're going to destroy the beast. And so this is, again, very similar to everything else. You have 10 kings, 10 horns, 10 toes. It's all the same stuff, burning with fire, just like the beast was burned with fire in, in Daniel 7. It's it's all the same stuff. It's it's talking about the Antichrist power. And in this case, another thing that's really important to remember is that the punishment for a daughter of a priest caught in fornication was to be burned. Now, if you were just a regular person, you would be stoned. But if you're the daughter of a priest, you would be burned with fire. Now, isn't that interesting? Who is the high priest? That's Jesus who is his daughter in this case, right? That's the apostate church that basically is going to be burned with fire, which is the papacy. And that'll be at the judgment when Christ returns because he will destroy them. So it's all very interesting how it comes together. There's so much more to talk about this. There really is. We'll talk about it in the next episode, but a couple things to take from this episode. A power that comes out of Rome, but has all the qualities of the previous empires, will oppress the church for 1260 years. We know that from the the abomination of desolation, we know that from Daniel 7, from Daniel 8, we know that from John, from Revelation 13. It's all the same power, okay? 
Now, it's going to appear like it has a mortal wound, and that happened in 1798 when the Pope was arrested, and the papacy seemed like it was over, but then it came back again. And if you remember from the episode we had last week on the French Revolution and the art of war, it's all by design, because the French Revolution created a dialectic. It created a dialectic between left and right, between liberalism and atheism and globalism, hardcore left and right, nationalism, you know, basically conservatism, all the, all the right side values. But that's on purpose, because by having the left to push against you, communism and atheism and all these, you know, crazy leftist ideologies, they push people where? Where do they push people? They push people into seeing that control by the church is needed. We need a moral authority. We need to have church and state unified because look what happens when people have gone so crazy with atheism and, and liberalism. We have lost our minds. And that's by design. We're living at the culmination of this as it's happening in history. But nevertheless, we've talked about this and we'll talk about it again. But a, a power that comes out of a place that's not very populated will act as a false prophet to shepherd people back into this ultimate reality of a church-state union. Now, that power is the United States. That is power that looks like Christianity, but actually legislates in a Luciferian way. It deceives. And because of that, it's going to create an image or representation to this Christian nationalist system that existed for 1,260 years. And people will worship by partaking in this system. And eventually this system is going to be worldwide. It's going to speak, right? The image is going to speak, so it's going to legislate. And it's going to speak in such a way, it's going to legislate in such a way that people will have to take a mark of the beast, a mark of the first beast. Now we have to look at what that first beast said was its mark. And that's really important because it did say what its mark was. And if you remember from Daniel, that power of the little horn changed times and laws. So it all makes so much sense. But this image, this system, will make people take the mark or basically not buy or sell. Now, we're not there yet, obviously. And it's not going to be AI. It's not going to be some jib-jab in your arm that, you know, you have to take or you won't be able to buy and sell. It's something spiritual because you can't lose your salvation by taking something into your body. It is something in your heart that you take. A belief, obedience to who? Who do you obey? That's the question. And so the mark of the beast is not something physical. Of course, it might be reinforced with something physical, but it's not something physical. It's a spiritual reality. Nevertheless, this second power, the false prophet, will bring people into the final iteration, which is Revelation 17. All of these, Revelation 13 and 17, these three beasts in John are actually encompassed in the little horn. They're encompassed of the little horn power. So actually, if we look at the prophetic timeline really quick, see if I can zoom out. So this is the little horn power. Now, if we look up and we zoom, so you have basically the timeline, but above is John, and you have this time period where if you see from here to here, there's a lot of things happening during this time period. You know, split up. It's the little horn time period, which matches Daniel. But again, John goes into spe more specific times about this little horn time period. It's a very important time period. You had the two witnesses. You had the first beast. You had the second beast. And you had the woman, basically, that's riding the beast that's coming out of the, the bottomless pit. And that's the final iteration that is toward the end time. So you have, sorry, I make a correction really quick. It's not the woman that's riding the beast that's in Revelation 13. It's the woman running away from the beast. So you had the two witnesses, the woman riding, uh, running away from the beast for 1260 years. You had the first beast and you had the second beast come out right at the mortal wound. That's when the second beast came up because we know that America was founded as a nation around that time. And Basically, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution was ratified, I believe, one of those, I forget which year exactly, but either way, 
This was the Luciferian system that looks like a lamb, speaks like a dragon, that would eventually shepherd people back into this Revelation 17 system, which is the final church-state union, which we're not there. This is the near future. You can see from this graph that you are here. And again, if you're listening to this, basically the point is that most of human history has passed. We have seen most of these prophecies being fulfilled, and we are right at the cusp. Now, I don't know when Jesus will return, but I think that we'll be in our lifetimes. I do believe that. I do believe that. And what that means is that all these things that are yet to come into Christian nationalist worldwide system that pays homage to the beast, that is on the horizon. And as you will see in the following episodes, you will see that I'm not exaggerating. I think that's very much based in truth and logic and scripture that that is on the horizon, unfortunately. But fortunately for us, because we know what the ending to this story is. So keep your eyes open. In the next couple episodes, we're going to dive deep into Mystery Babylon and how the papacy fulfills all these prophecies. Again, if this is news to you, I hope you pay attention. I hope you will tune in for that episode. And the following episodes, we're going to get into some really deep stuff. So make sure you're subscribed and do so on my website because... You never know with these platforms. You don't want to miss it. We're going to get into some really cool stuff in the next couple of weeks. So I hope to see you there. I hope this has been a blessing to you. Until next time, God bless and take it easy.